Hi, this is Roger from Kanker Labs with another attempt to find a usable battery tester. And after three months of waiting for this part here from China, it finally arrived and it just took half an hour to destroy this thing. Uh, if you look closely here, you can see I've already desoldered and I see where the magic smoke has escaped because I accidentally put a little bit more than 12 volts here at the power input and the magic smoke immediately started to escape through a blowhole which you can see in the background. Um, the part is the well-known good old MC35063 switching regulator and I really have no idea this thing should work up to 40 volts and I only put 18 volts here why it was destroyed but this gives us the opportunity to take a closer look at this thing and uh, do some try some repair work to see if we get this thing running again um, now you can see this thing has many connections um, let's start it's, it needs external power uh, that's one of the big differences to other so-called battery testers because to work as a constant current load in this case not source as I said before down to low voltages basically down to zero volts you of course need an external voltage source for the gate driving uh, voltage so that's no problem uh, for me and you have a lot of connections where you can put your load on all kinds of USB jacks. Here we have the standard 2.1 times 5.5 millimeter barrel jack and two screw ter terminals. And this USB connector is for, uh, let me just take a look. What is it for quick charge trigger in? Uh -huh. Okay, I don't need that, but this thing apparently is also designed uh, to test USB chargers. And you have a nice little dot matrix LCD graphics to display all, all your measurement values. And the current is set with this, these two potentiometers for coarse and fine settings. So it is set manually and not digitally. Uh, a little push button and that's all. Uh, I've already tried to identify um, some of the components. Here this is of course the main MOSFET. It's an IRF P264 which is rated for 250 volts and around 30 amps continuous current and it has 75 milliohms RDS on resistance. Usually what I've already taken off is this big CPU fan to cool this thing otherwise we couldn't uh, look at the inarts here and what else do we have here i already told you here's the switching regulator probably to get the five volt supply voltage for the microcontroller and and the gate voltage etc and what else do we have we have two dual schottky diodes um rated for uh, 40 amps and 100 volts. Uh, they are probably reverse protection diodes and a few smaller, uh, more or less smaller Schottky diodes. This one here is 5 amps rated. This one here is 1 amps rated. And the only two other ICs I could identify, this here is a little 4 kilobyte EEPROM and 24C32. And this is the main controller and the marking was hardly readable. It reads as O2, the O is as zero, also it's 02KR302. And if you Google this, I found just one single Chinese page from a forum where this thing is mentioned. So uh, it has 16 pins. I don't know if it's a genuine Chinese microcontroller or a ripoff of a Western world better known controller. And we have two heavy current shunts and a little beeper. 
And um, let's, before we repair this, uh, try to resolder a new switching regulator here. Uh, let's try to measure if one of the other components has also been busted by my little mishappening. So let's make a quick check if we find any sh further shorts and if the diodes have survived. Okay, this one seems okay. What about this one? Yeah, also seems okay. Let's try this one here. Probably the other way around. Yeah, also okay. Where else here? We have this big fat diode. Also looks okay. The other way around. Yeah. And let's see if we find any short in the in the MOSFET. No, it also seems okay. We could even try to measure the MOSFET in circuit with our little component tester. Let's try to connect the mini grabbers. As I mentioned in another video, it's quite difficult to measure semiconductors in circuit because you never know what other components are in parallel to them. But let's give it a try. No, it cannot measure, but that has nothing to say. Um, we'll just, with a desoldered, broken switching regulator, we'll try to put power on and see if this thing still powers on and see what happens. So, let's see. And we get a display. Very nice, very nice. So apparently, even a, the blue LED is lit up. Apparently, the microcontroller is not supplied by the switch mode regulator. Uh, probably this part here is a 5 volt uh, regulator purely for the purpose of the microcontroller. And we already can see some things. So it displays voltage, current, watts, amp hours, watt hours, that's nice. And this must be the internal resistance, temperature, time. So we get a full display of all the values that are of interest. I don't know if, if it's good to see for you. Perhaps if I tilt it a little bit, you can see it a little bit better. Uh, the LCD seems to be even backlit. So anyway, let's see when we scroll through the menu. Backlight off, okay. It's a similar display with Chinese letters. Okay, we apparently get different kinds of the display, but the first one, which was this one here, seemed to be the most complex, no, it's not, this was the first one apparently. It even has stored the last setting, so that's nice because I can remember when I tested this thing before I blew it up, I had tested it with, let me just get it, uh, with a nickel metal hydride 1.25 volt rechargeable battery and it was nearly fully discharged so it, it stopped at 1.42 amp hours. So this looks quite promising uh, that we can get this back to work again. So now let's try to resolder the switch mode regulator and then see if we get this fully working again. 
So before resoldering the broken IC, I'll show you some tools that I'm using here and at my home lab for doing SMD rework. For me, one of the most important tools is this preheater station. Uh, it's a cheap Atom, what is it, 853A. Um, it has a small area with a temperature controlled airflow and you can uh, switch on the fan and the heater separately and the purpose of this thing is to warm the PCB from the underside. Uh, I, I set it to a little bit below 150 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature where the FR4 material starts to soften and the reason for this is quite simple. If your PCB is already heated to let's say 130 degree you only need from the upper side an additional 80 or 90 degrees just to make the solder reflow again while if you are only heating it from the top then you first of all get a lot of thermal stresses in your PCB because your PCB is only heated locally to a very high temperature differential. So for example here the IC will be heated to 300 degrees Celsius while one centimeter away it's only let's say 100 degrees Celsius. So and to avoid these big temperature differentials you just preheat the for a few minutes or one minute, depends a little bit on experience, you preheat your the area of your PCB where you want to do your rework or reflow work just to a little bit below the temperature where the material, the PCB material starts to soften and then it's much easier to reflow the solder. And this thing has a few two magnetic holders that's not the ideal solution, but you don't always find a position where your PCB like here is, is cannot be balanced and you have to experiment a little bit. But uh, for the price, this thing is really worth its weight in gold. And the next thing I always do is I, I hate these flux pens uh, simply because flux which is usually dissolved in alcohol, it simply ev evaporates too quickly. What's 100 times better is this gel-like flux from Edson. And if you've used this once, you will never use anything else because it's much better. Uh, it has a gel-like constitution and you can press a little pieces out of it like we call it a, in German a little sausage that comes out. I don't know how good you can see it and I will, I will make a when I find the time a separate video about especially this thing here and this helps very much in reflowing and desolder work and also in soldering SMD ICs and because of its gel-like constitution it simply doesn't evaporate immediately. Then when uh, I reflowed the, the broken IC here and took it away with these little tweezers, next thing I did, the solder pads are of course now not even anymore. So I took away the remains of the solder with uh, this solder wick. I've tried out, I don't know, nearly a dozen different solder wicks, but for me, this one here from Contact Chemie or CRC works best. And I will also demonstrate this in a separate video at some time. And then I put a little even layer of fresh solder onto the solder pads. And that should all help together now with some fresh solder uh, flux gel here which also helps in keeping 
the component in position. And now I'll stop the camera for a minute just to position the IC correctly. So uh, let's turn on the preheater. I hope the fan noise is not too loud so that you can still can hear me. And the second thing is you need one of these ubiquitous cheap hot air guns or rework stations. Um, the Atom 858D, the cheapest one and for the hobbyist use completely sufficient and I've set it to 300 degrees, 350 would also be okay. Let's set it a little bit higher to let's say 330. So the set temperatures, they are a little bit from your feeling and from your experience. So let's wait still a little bit until the PCB is fully heated and then let's try to reflow this. You might perhaps see some little steam coming up. That is from the evaporating solder jelly. And I already can see the tin flowing. So this should be it. I will inspect the solder joints with my uh, jeweler's magnifier, which I also showed you in another video. And let's see if this thing works again. So the reflowed solder joints have turned out really nice. I've inspected them with a magnifier. I'm sorry, I can't show you a microscope a photo. Uh, simply because I couldn't reach uh, the focus here because of all, of all the surrounding components. So let's try to power this thing up. I, and you might have noticed I've of course taken out the LCD d during reflowing because, LCD, because LCDs are notoriously sensitive to temperature and it could have been broken by the high temperature hot air. And we get at least our display. Back, so nothing was broken more than it was before and now I will take the risk uh, without the fan to connect these uh, nickel metal hydride rechargeable battery um, because I've set the, the potentiometers of course to zero because it only has 1.25 volts and even if I pull one amp out of it uh, we only get slightly more than one watt which should be no problem for the MOSFET even without the cooling fan. So let's see. And first we got the voltage display 1.34 volts with no load and now I'll just turn up a little bit the potentiometer for the fine control and it works 30 milliamps 120 milliamps 140 and you can see how the voltage drops here so this should be working again let's see if it becomes hot no it doesn't So we get, a, of course, a, already a large voltage drop because this, uh, this battery is quite old and has developed quite a high internal resistance. But we're getting half an amp out of it. Okay, this thing seems to work again. And so it's time to check all the functionality and to see if this is really useful for checking the capacity of batteries uh, that will be in one of the 
next videos. Anyway, I'm happy that the repair seems to have worked and that was it for today. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Bye from Roger. Bye from Kanka Labs.